Yeah, I'm going to ask Albert his thoughts on George Galloway when he when he re- returns. Because <laughs> <laughs> lately, that's all I've been hearing is George Galloway and all media trying to set him up. You know what I mean? Well, one after yes. another after another. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's... He, he didn't lose an argument though. No. You gotta you gotta give him credit for it. He's... Well, yeah, of course. I mean, he's good at what he does. There's no doubt about that. You know. Yeah. But he fight, he fights his argument very well. Um, whether you agree with him or not, he just he puts up. He gives as good as he well. He gives more than he he gets to be honest, because um, he leaves them dead and silence most of the time. But whether you agree with him or not, that, that's by the by. Yeah. Who's that? Uh, George Galloway. Uh, I don't like Galloway at all. Actually, I think he's an obnoxious shite. <laughs> um, but he's he's um, you know he, he's he's consistently obnoxious, isn't he? You know, <laughs> there, there, you, you, Galloway. There is only one Galloway, and that's an obnoxious of Galloway. You know, there's nothing nice about Galloway at all. The only thing you can say about that, of course, is obnoxious to everybody. <clears throat> well, he's, he, he didn't lose many arguments, though, Albert. Well, I don't know about that. It's just that he, you know, he shouts down people, doesn't he? Yeah. He, he, if you were with the Muslims for too long, the louder you shout, the more people just back away from you. But he is a union man, though, isn't he? I mean, he, he talked up for, you know, the, the independence vote. I mean, he... He pinned his, his, you know, pinned himself on the colours of the, the Union Jack, didn't he? Yeah. So that was quite. I don't know. Is it rare? Yeah. I'm a Scottish man. I don't know. Scotsman. Yeah, yeah. Something else we've done that to uh, talk about Union Jack. Um, in Northern Ireland, there is a town called Magaresh or something like that, Magareth. Oh yeah. Um, which has got a Sinn Fein council. And the Sinn Féin Council wanted to take down the Union flag off the council buildings. And they were saying that unless the people agreed to them taking the Union flags down, they weren't going to pay for the Christmas decorations for the town. (laughs) So people in Northern Ireland contacted me and said, you know, what can we do about this? And I said, well, talk to Garter King at Arms. They said, well, who's he? And I said, well, he's a responsible man, directly answerable to the Queen. But everything to do with flags. So talk to Garter King at Arms and see what he says. So they phoned Garter King at Arms and he said, no, they can't do that. Once a Union flag has been raised, um, by law, it cannot be taken down ever until such time that it's in such a dilapidated state that it needs repairing. And then once it's been up, you then replace it with a brand new one. But once it's been up at all, then it has to stay up. That is the law. You can't take it down. So if you put a flagpole outside your house one day and you stick a union flag on it, and the local council come and say, take that down, then you say, no, I'm not going to do that. Because once it's gone up, it has to stay up. That's the law. And um, of course, their local council were told this, and they said, no, that's rubbish. We're not going to worry about that. So then the people went back to Garter King at Arms, Garter King at Arms got hold of the local council and squared them up. Uh, not only do the flags staying, but they're paying for the lights as well. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it the same with the Cross of St George? I would think so, yeah, because it's, you see, the Cross of St George is, is a heraldic flag. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. a heraldic flag. Not like this bloody European rubbish. <laughs> you know. How many stars? <laughs> Where, where, where I live, Tame Town Council, the, the town hall there, they had two little flag staffs outside. One they were flying a Union flag on, one they were flying a European flag on. So I went into the town council and I said, right, get that heap of shite off of there. And they said, what? I said, that bloody heap of rubbish, that lump of rag you've got hanging up there, get rid of it. <laughs> it's got no right to be there. This is Middle England. We don't have foreign flags flying here proclaiming any sort of ownership of us. 
get rid of that piece of rag before I get rid of it. Anyway, they sent a man out to take it down. It's never been uh, taken. It's never been put back. And at one stage, there were two union flags up there, so one on each flag pole. <laughs> but you've got to go and you've got to demand it. You know, yeah, then, you have to demand then, it. Didn't they try and did during one of the world the football world cups? They tried to in Parliament stop people from from flying. Um, uh, the Cross of St George. I, I, I don't know if it's a, well, well, yeah, but you say they can't because Parliament. If if if, if anything comes up about flags, as Parliament, as the racism, you know, all this yeah, par Parliament, Parliament, yeah, but you see, Parliament is this all bollocks, isn't it? Parliament, Parliament, Parliament. In fact, if anything comes up with flags, it's referred to Garter King at Arms. Right. As far as Garter King at Arms is concerned, Parliament are like everybody else in this country. They do what they're bloody well told. Uh, you know, they might be Parliament, but he's got a king at arms and he's responsible for flags. Um, and that he's responsible directly to the Queen for the flags. So, you know, Parliament might think that they know better, but stuff it, he's king at arms, Parliament do what they like, or Parliament go to jail, one or the other. You know, I mean, it's, it's that simple for as far as he's concerned. So it's just like, it's like, um, I think it was a week or two weeks ago, Meadowall Shopping Centre in Sheffield, the uh, security there, we're, t we're standing at doors asking people if they didn't mind removing the poppies so they didn't offend anyone. Well, I would have turned around and told the security people to get stuffed. <laughs> you know. Well, that's true. Oh, I, no, I would have done. I would have, I, I, in fact, I didn't, I'd I didn't, I didn't, believe, arrest, I didn't believe it at I mean, first. I'd have been, I've been inclined to make a citizen's arrest for breach of the peace. You know, I, I, I've arrested him because I wanted to prevent a breach of the peace. And well, where was the breach of the peace? Well, if he kept up by insisting I take the bottle off, I was going to deck him. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about what about this so-called power given to council enforcement officers? How do you feel on that? Well, it depends on what they're doing. Um, I, see, Tony Blair with the 2002 Police Reform Act. He allows, because there was a question about this on, on Facebook uh, this week, mm -hmm. somebody's being called in to be interviewed by the local council. And <clears throat> I was called in to be interviewed by my local council because I had an industrial accident at work and I was on disability. And there was every possibility that I was going to die. <clears throat> so I, I wrecked my lungs. Uh, there was every possibility I would die. In fact, most people who got what I had die within three to five years. Oh. <coughs> I've actually lasted longer than that now. But nevertheless, at the time, I thought there was every chance I would be dead in a couple of years. So I was more interested than in, in, than in saving my life that I was in filling their idiot forms in. So when I went for a, 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 an ATOS medical, and they said, can you bend down and stand up? I did. I could have done it once. I did it once. If they'd asked me to do it twice, I couldn't have done it. I'd have fallen over. I should have fallen over the first time, really, but I didn't. Yeah. And, and so they stopped, my, they stopped my invalidity. So I thought to myself, well, if they stop this one, because I wasn't getting unemployment pay or sick pay, I was just getting an invalidity. If they stop this, if I fill in all the forms, I'll get the other. So it's six of one half a dozen the other. I'm more interested in researching what's wrong with my lungs so I can do something about it um, and than, than I am in filling in their idiot forms. So I didn't fill them in. Then they called me in um, to uh, prosecute me and interview me under caution uh, for doing this. Well, I being a policeman I understand interviews and I understand interviews under caution because I'm trained to do them and I understand the law dealing with them and the 2002 Police Reform Act is actually illegal law it is bad law it is bad law because it attempts to repeal by implied repeal the major constitutional law the Bill of Rights which forbids the granting of dispensations for all time and the, the police reform bill uh, allows the granting to the police of dispensations to stop avoiding police investigating policemen who are accused of criminal offences 
Oh. Yeah. So if it's, say you're a young woman and you're driving your car down the road, you're a nice looking young girl and you've got a low cut top on and a lovely pair of boobs and the policeman stops you and he looks into your car and he's looking down the front of your dress and he thinks, oh, you know, it's a girl on her own, no witnesses, nothing, sticks his hand down the front of your dress, right? I mean, it happens. Shouldn't, yeah. but it does, right? You then drive off to the police station in High Dutch and you can put complaining about it. Now it doesn't hurt the inspector that you're making the complaint to, he just fills in the form and sends it off. So there's nothing, no skin off his nose. When it gets to the complaints department, complaints department writes to the IPCC and they ask for a dispensation against investigating this allegation of, of, of indecent assault on the grounds that it's vexatious. They don't supply any evidence to substantiate why it is vexatious and the IPCC then rubber stamp it and then the police come back to the young woman and say well we've applied to have this scrapped because the allegation is vexatious uh, and the IPCC have agreed with that so we're not going to investigate and we don't have to investigate it by law. So that's illegal because you're granting a dispensation from the penalty for an offence which is illegal for all time under the Bill of Rights. They also removed the words, our sovereign lady, from the, the police oath. Now, by doing that, they're actually removing Her Majesty's style and honour as a sovereign queen, which in fact is an act of treason, contrary to Section 3, I think it is, of the 1848 Treason Felony Act. It also imagines Her Majesty's death as a sovereign queen, which is high treason, contrary to the 1351 Treason Act. Now, you can't have a law which is committing treason. So, so the common law automatically comes up and voids that law. But what it does do is it grants councils the right to interview people under caution. And certain people are allocated by the council police powers in order to carry out these interviews. Oh. Now, what the actual Police Reform Act says is that a director general of a council can in fact appoint somebody to um, conduct an interview under caution. Now, understand what I'm saying here. A director general of a council can appoint somebody to conduct interviews under caution under the police powers, right? Oh, go on then. Now, how many councils in this country do you know that have a director general? I don't know any. I had to think what, you know, our director general would fit in that position. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, the, so the councils don't have director generals. That is a continental way of putting it. Continental councils have director generals. We don't. We have chief executives. Mm -hmm. Right? But the law passed by Parliament, given to Parliament, I'm sure, by Europe, Oh, talks, okay. uh, talks about director generals. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, when I went for my interview, I went there and I said to them, the first thing I said to them was, how much do you think I owe you? Because I just had a payout for my industrial injury. So I'd gone there with £2,000 in my pocket, £20 notes. And they said, well, you owe us £300. I said, right, well, I'll pay you that now. So I can't, I takes out his two grand out of my pocket and I start counting off 20 pound notes to give him 300 quid. They said, oh no, we can't take that. I said, no, you told me I owe you 300 pound. It is 300 pound, I want a receipt for it. So they had to give me a receipt for the 300 pound. So now I don't owe him any money. Then they said, I said to them, why didn't you just come round my house, knock on my door and ask if we could have a chat about this and I'd have made us a cup of tea and we could have a nice friendly chat about it in my house and we could have sorted this out perfectly amicably without dragging me from one side of the county to the other. And you particularly get paid to get dragged around the county, I don't. Hmm. So they said to me, well, we, can, we don't do it that way, we do it this way. So I said, okay. So anyway, they, they conducted their interview, and for half an hour they kept saying to me, you, you were stealing money from the council, and I'm saying, no, I wasn't. More interested in staying alive than I was in filling in your idiot forms. If you didn't pay it me as, it, as, as, as uh, disability money, you'd have had to pay it for me as sick pay or as unemployment pay, one or the other. I'd have got it somewhere on the line, 
It makes no difference at the end of the day financially to the state. I've still got the same amount of money. just comes out of a different door. Yeah? So I was uh, more interested in staying alive than I was in filling in your idiot forms. And that's what I told them for half an hour. After the half an hour, they said to me, well, we're not going to prosecute you. I said, thank you very much. They said, but we can fine you. I said, no, you can't. And they said, no, we can fine you. I said, no, you can't. I said, yes, we can fine you 30% of what you owe us. And I said, no, you can't. And they said, no, we can. It says so in the law. I said, the Bill of Rights says, and Magna Carta of 1215 say, that I cannot suffer any fine or forfeiture unless I have been found guilty in a, of an offence in a court of law. Yeah. You have just told me you are not going to prosecute me in a court of law, therefore I am never going to be found guilty, therefore you can't fine me. Yeah. Albert, they, 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 they tried to do the same to me when I got myself a job. And for the yeah. first, first month, you, you know, you've got to support yourself. <laughs> The, yeah. And I said, well, I'm meant to do that. They said, that th this is the advice the job centre gave me. They said to me, go go and see your employer and ask him or her for a sub. Now, I've not even started work, Albert. You know, and bear in mind you get a three-month probation. So, yeah. I, I weren't prepared to go in and, you know, pester, hey. pester my employer to ask him for a sub. So, what I did is I carried on signing on for the first month and then I signed off. But yeah. Then, well, anyway, they found out about it, dragged me down, with, you know, as they do, saying, oh, well, we're, you know, we're going to take you to court and all this. So I, I goes, all right, then, I'll, I'll see you there. And then we argued about it, and they said, right, well, what we'll do is we'll fine you £107. So I argued that one, and then I got a letter two weeks later saying, hey, although we are not, um, um, we are not taking, taking this action further, we, this matter will not be forgotten. Or along them yeah. lines, and that's it, they left me alone. And they, they, then they said to me, uh, and we can give you a caution. I said, no you can't. <laughs> they said, yes we can, we can give you a caution. I said, no you can't. They said, no the law says we can give you a caution. I said, you can't give me a caution unless I admit the offence. I've just spent half an hour talking into your idiot machine, <laughs> telling you that I deny the offence. So you can't give me a caution. So they said, oh, I said, now, I want you to pick up that pen there and I want you to take it over that piece of paper and I want you to write down on the piece of paper the Bill of Rights of 1689. And underneath that, I want you to write Magna Carta 1215. Then I want you to go and find that computer that my taxes have been paying for all my life and I want you to Google the Bill of Rights of 1689 and Magna Carta of 1215. You have my full permission as a taxpayer to actually use some of the paper and ink that I'm paying for to actually print out the Bill of Rights and Magna Carta. And then I want you to take time, I will grant you the time to go away and sit down and study. Because you obviously don't know anything about the constitutional law of this country and you really do need it. And then they said, oh, okay. And I said, now, we just spent half an hour with me arguing it, with me talking into your idiot machine. I've been denying every offense that you've said I've committed. I could have stood here and I could have admitted absolutely everything you say I've done. I'm not gonna do it, I haven't done it, I'm not gonna do that, but I could have done. And it is not, available as evidence in a court of law and they said what do you mean of course it would be i said no it isn't i said you get your authority because the bill the, the police reform act allows a director general of a council to actually grant certain officers of the council police powers under certain circumstances and they said yes i said i looked up south oxfordshire district council before i came here today you do not have a director general Therefore, there is no one on the council that actually has the authority to grant you the police powers that you've just been abusing. So they said to me, well, no, our chief executive did it. I said, the law doesn't say chief executive. The law, as passed by parliament, says a director general. You don't have a director general. It does not say a director general or a director of a department or a chief executive. 
It simply says a director general of a council. You don't have one. There is nobody in this council who can grant you the powers that you are purporting to use. And they sort of look at you as though to say, oh, oh, you know, you're fucking mad. So, so if somebody, uh, so if you're in the street, in your local town, you're in the public area, you're not actually on a private precinct, you're not in a shop, you're in a public area of the town, and a, a policy enforcement officer employed by the local council wants to try and stick something on you, like you drop a piece of paper and you don't see it. Yeah. It, one of these one of these enforcement officers comes along and says, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give you a, a statutory penalty notice for that. Yeah. Because you just dropped that piece of paper. And this has actually happened several times. Um, I could do the same as what you've just said because they don't have a director general to give them that power. Not, uh, not, not to give them police powers, no. And, uh, and, but, but the other thing is, of course, that... You, in order to commit a criminal offence, yeah. you have to have a criminal intent. You have to have the mental intention of doing it. If you pull a handkerchief out of your pocket and your petrol receipt from the Tesco's garage falls out onto the floor without you knowing it, you have no criminal intent. Therefore, there is no crime. Therefore, you can't be given a ticket because you, you, you know, no and you appeal no that all the way and you say, look, I didn't take it out of my pocket and deliberately throw it on the floor. I pulled out my hanky to blow my nose and it came out and accidentally fell on the floor. I didn't, I wasn't aware it had fallen on the floor until this gentleman told me about it. Right, but, well, let, let's just say, he says, well, I'm not having that. I saw you, I saw you do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ask for police assistance to have you arrested if you don't. Act. Well, then, then I, I would say, look, I tell you what, you ask for the police to come here. I will talk to the police. Let's hope they understand the law of this country better than you do. <laughs> so they, they've got no power to arrest all these citizens' arrest, haven't they? No, got, no, no. And, 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 and in fact, what you then say not, is, well, I'm police. going now, I'm work. going now, and if he detains you, and the police come, and you're not charged by the police, then in fact you can, you can actually have him arrested for unlawful detention. Right. Okay. That's cool. Well, I'm glad you told us about the Director General because I thought, well, where's this going, Canada? <laughs> well, this is the point, you know. Yeah. This is the point, you know. If 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 you if, you, if there, there was a Danny Kay film out about uh, the, the um, oh god, what was it? The, the 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 guy that was stealing all the children. Um, it was a film with Danny Kaye years and years and years ago. You probably never heard of bloody Danny Kaye. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah. And 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 uh, he he they had in his town, which was in France, a director of a director general of the council. They had a director general, but we don't have director generals here. But if you look at the Police Reform Act, it specifically states a director general of a council. Wow. can award police powers. So it doesn't say a director general or a chief executive. And your argument is that the council, as my argument was, the council are not able to put their own meaning on what the, what the parliament pass. Parliament pass it, and one, one must assume that parliament know what they're talking about. They don't, obviously, but let you just assume that they do. The yeah. Parliament pass a law and say a director general. So what, what, that means it has to, has to be a director general. Doesn't have to. Can't be a, a chief executive because it doesn't say a chief executive. Yeah. Why don't they just get put these in in positions then, Albert? If that's the case, is it not easy well, for them to do that? Well, yeah, but you don't. You don't. You don't actually want to tell them to do that, do you? But they're going to do that, though, aren't they? Well, this, uh, well, this is probably to do with the EU takeover. Yeah. And they're really getting ready for the EU takeover, but they're not taking over. And we don't have director generals on our councils. We have chief executives. Right. And this is the point. And, but the law, as it's written, specifically says a director mm -hmm. general. It doesn't say a director general or a chief executive or a director of a department. Oh, what it says right. is yeah. a director general. And we don't have them. Uh, that's interesting. That's the Police Reform Act. 2002, is it? Yeah. 
I'm just going to make a note of that. <laughs> well, you, you want to download it and print it, because it's complete bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they've taken a perfectly good workable police oath. They have removed the words "our sovereign lady" from it, which means that the, the oath itself is treasonable. It means right. anybody who took that oath and, and is now purporting to be a police officer has taken part in an act of treason. And if you've taken part in an act of treason, even unwittingly, you are barred from life for ever holding the office of constable under the regulations. So every policeman out there who took the new oath from the 2002 Police Reform Act, which is quite a lot of them now, because they've had it for 12 years, so every policeman over the last 12 years who's taken the oath is not actually a police officer, they're actually impersonating a police officer. Which is, um, <laughs> in defense, this, no this, is why, this is why if you, if you say to them, you know, are you, you know, are you standing under your oath, but that, that don't matter anymore, does it? Well, I mean, the short answer is, it's a stupid question to ask them anyway. It's just like when they go to court and they say to the judge, are you under your common law oath? Uh, well, which they go, well, well, do you believe in your oath? Is it, you know? No, no, they, they ask them, are you under your common law oath? And the judges don't answer. So then they turn around and they say, right, well, they, you, you know, you're vacating the court. So, you know, you're not a, a proper judge. So we're, we're now discharging the case, right? Why do the judges leave the court? Because they are leaving the court because they are actually suspending the trial. That's what they're doing. They're well, not okay. stopping it. Confused? They're not stopping it. You will simply get another summons in the post to come back at a different day. Next time you come back, the court will be full of policemen. But why, why should he leave? Why should he, why should he not just stand in front of but, but you see, the point is, the free men on the land, they have no idea what the law in this country actually is. They talk about the judge and his common law oath. Judges have never, ever taken a common law oath. Well, they swear an allegiance to the Queen, though, don't they? They, they? they swore, originally they would swear allegiance to the King. After the 1559 Act of Supremacy, they would take the oath from the Act of Supremacy up until 1668, when they took the oath from the Promissory Oaths Act. And a judge would then take two oaths. He would take the oath of loyalty to the king and the judicial oath. But all of those oaths are statute law. They're not common law and judges have never taken a common law oath, they've only ever taken statute law oath. And, and and so when these people go up there and they say, are you under your common law oath? Are you, are, you know, are you keeping your common law oath? The judge, he can't answer that question because he's never taken a common law oath. Mm. And this is the point, you see, the free men on the land movement, they think they're being so bloody clever and they know so much, and in fact they know sweet Fanny Adams. You know, so it's, like this, it's like this thing, isn't it? They've now discovered that the DNA of Richard III is different to the DNA of Queen Elizabeth. No, they've seen that. that. But yeah, what they've said, yeah, yeah. they say it doesn't affect the yeah. position, though, does it? So, so they're, they're saying, well, you know, this means that Queen Elizabeth is not the Queen. It doesn't mean any such thing. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. When yeah. Richard III was killed by Henry Tudor, Henry Tudor usurped the crown. Whoever wears the crown is the legitimate king of England. Now, if one of Richard's family could have fought back and taken the crown, then it would have gone back to one of the Plantagenets to wear it, because he would then be A, the, the one entitled in next to line for the throne, and B, the one who actually won it in battle. But they didn't do that. Henry Tudor kept it. That meant that then the Tudors had usurped the crown, but as long as they were wearing the crown, they were the legitimate king of England. Up until 1689, when the Stuarts, who were related to the Tudors anyway, lost the crown because they were then chucked out because James Stuart was, ran away to France, so it was declared that he'd abdicated. And then a meeting of the Estates of England invited William of Orange to come over and take the crown subject to him agreeing 
to abide by the ancient rules and restrictions based on our kings, which he did, which was the Bill of Rights of 1689. That meant that the estates of England, who actually hire and fire kings and parliaments, because they are the highest living body in the country, much higher than Bob, much higher than the king. The estates of England changed the royal household of England. So it wouldn't matter whether the queen was related to Richard III or not. It's irrelevant because the whole line was changed to the line of William of Orange. Now, because Mary was the legitimate next in line to the throne after James, because he was her, he was his daughter, um, when she died without having any children, it went to her sister, who was the Electress Sophia of Hanover. Uh, when the when the elect no, then it went to her sister Anne, Queen Anne. Yeah. When Anne died in 1714, it went to the Electress Sophia of Hanover, who was another sister. But the Electress had died already. So it went to the Electress's oldest son, which was George I. So George I, although he was George I of Hanover, he was also a steward. So then George II, then George III, and when George III came, as I put it out in a letter to the House of the Parliament Library, over the, over the prerogative and that, where they were sold, no, no not the, the library, the, the Cabinet Office, where they said that the Bill of Rights changed it all and everything else, and that, that, that transferred sovereignty from the House of Commons to, from the King to the House of Commons. Mm. And I wrote back and said, well, you've obviously never heard of the fact that King George III, who was after the Bill of Rights by some hundred and odd years, yeah. King George III had a 20-year running battle with the House of Commons, and there was a, a after an impassioned speech by William uh, Lord Chatham, who was William Pitt the Elder. After this impassioned speech by, by William Pitt, the or Lord Chatham there was in fact a vote taken in the House as to whether sovereignty lay with George as the anointed King of England or with the House of Commons as the elected authority. And by the parliamentary vote, King George won the vote. There has never been a vote since. So King George, Queen Elizabeth, is the sovereign queen of this country, not only by natural rights as the anointed king or the anointed queen, but by parliamentary vote. So she's still head sovereign. She's still completely the head sovereign. She doesn't believe it. She doesn't know it because nobody's bothered to tell her. I've asked if I could go and talk to her about it. Well, still did George the Sixth told her. I thought. Oh no, George the Sixth wouldn't have known either. So when George, was, George VI was never meant to be king, was he? King George V was never meant to be king. No. King George, king George V had an older brother who died of pneumonia. So that's why George VI, was, George v became king. He hadn't been trained in constitutional law because he was never going to need it because he wasn't going to be king. George VI, wasn't, George VI wasn't going to be trained in constitutional law because he was never going to be king. Wasn't it meant to be Edward? was meant to be Edward VIII, yes, but then Edward VIII couldn't keep it in his trousers, like Henry VIII. <laughs> well, got a practical answer as well, haven't you, Albert? <laughs> well, it's just the thing, isn't it, you know? <laughs> Wallace, 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 I understand, did a phenomenal blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so so when King George the Third died, you, what you're saying is what? The, William the Fourth came next, didn't he? Was it William? Yeah, the yeah, I think so. So, but you see, Prince William the Fourth, William the Fourth was a fully sovereign king, and every king since George the Third has been a fully sovereign king or queen. When did this get forgotten then? Uh, it gets forgotten because Parliament don't want to remember. It's like, for example, 
Um, I, I've got a very good set of books on the, on the history of the Houses of Parliament. And up until, up until 1818, the House of Commons did not have a library. What they had was all of the rolls from Parliament were just slung in a heap in a corner somewhere. They hadn't been catalogued, so if you wanted to know what had happened in a given time, you couldn't find it because you had to run through hundreds of rolls. In 1818, they allocated a room and they hired a librarian to catalog it and they gave him some money to buy some books. So the librarian bought some books and then he spent the next 16 years going through all these parliamentary roles, going back to the year dot, cataloguing them, doing a card index of them, saying what the role is, where it was and roughly what it was about. So, so members of parliament could go into the library, look through the card index, go to the third shelf along, second, second shelf down and then they could pull out the role that dealt with their problem. Unfortunately, 16 years after they'd are employed the librarian and, but it's, and just after he'd finished doing his cataloging so that everybody could find everything, there was a mysterious fire in the library which destroyed everything. So all of these parliamentary roles going back hundreds of years all went up in smoke. Therefore there was no record of what the law was or how or why in parliament. Therefore, members of parliament couldn't find it. Therefore, they thought they would make it up as they go along. And that's what they've been doing ever since. So your, so your research on... on in, 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 in 1834, there was a massive fire in the library and everything in the library was destroyed. After that, they, they allocated three much larger rooms which they had built at the Palace of Westminster with big, big rooms with lots of natural daylight and they then re-equipped it. But of all of the thousands of books in there, there are only 140 books on constitutional law. Of those 140 books, only 17 are older than 1911 and the oldest of them is 1668. Um. Now I've got a copy of that on order. Facimil copy of that book on order. Well, that'd be gold dust if you can get it. Well, I've, I've got it, it's coming. I've ordered it, I've paid for it and everything else, it's coming. Right mm. now, I will, over a period, look down the list again of, of books in the thing. But from basically the 1973, so between 1911 and 1971, 72, 73, these books will all have reasonable amount of knowledge in them. Right? right, but they will not have the knowledge of the really old books. And um, but between 1973 and 2014, all of those constitutional law books will be full up with European shite. <laughs> so they've got no relation to our law whatsoever. You can see it unfolding, can't you? It's horrifying, isn't it? Really, yeah. About it. Even going, they, even going back to the... They, 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 have, they have Professor Dicey's book on the Constitution in there, but Professor Dicey is rubbish because Professor Dicey uh, wrote a book on the Constitution in line with the views of the politicians of the day. So he altered the Constitution to suit the political feelings of the time. You can't do that. So Dicey is wrong. I've got Jennings, who's the other one of the same, same ilk, and, and Jennings has done the same thing. It's just rubbish. It, it no relationship to the Constitution. I got a book called The Prerogatives of the King, a, a treatise on the prerogatives of the King and the duties and responsibilities of the subject, published in 1820 by a bloke called Joseph Chitty, who was a barrister. In that book, it tells me about denizens. So I've also got Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. So I look up denizens in Blackstone's commentaries of the laws of England, which is in 1768. So I'm going back in time now. And denizens in there, it's exactly the same what denizens can and can't do in there as it is in Chitty. Right. So I then go back to Sir Matthew Hale. And I look up under the prerogatives of the king, I look up denizens. 
Now, so Matthew Hale is 1713. But that tells me exactly the same thing as it tells me in Chitty, that denizens are not allowed to be ennobled, nor can they hold any public office of any kind whatsoever. So I'm chasing the law back. When I get this book from 1628, I'm going to look up denizens. That's the first thing I'm going to look up. Because I want to trace this right the way back to the beginnings of time, if I can. Yeah. So I, I can show continuity. Now, if these two later, two, uh, uh, they are undoubtedly there will be Labour MPs, these two Muslims. If they report me to the police, the police come along to interview me, I shall just chuck a load of books at them and say, look, fucking look it up for yourself. Yeah. Are you sure you get your books back, Albert? I'm not going to let them take away, <laughs> sod that. <laughs> Do me first. <laughs> you know. Say, I'm sorry, we've got to take them back to the office for evidence, Albert. No, <laughs> no. I'm going with them then. No, I, no, I will simply say to them, no, they're my evidence. They are legal documents. You are not allowed to serve, you are not allowed to, to seize legal documents. Ooh. You see, if, if the police, if the police come and exercise a search warrant on your home, and they open up a filing cabinet and there's a load of legal papers there to do with your personal legal stuff. Police are not allowed to take them. They're not allowed to look at them. Okay. I'm not saying that they won't take them and they won't look at them. But if they can get away with it, they probably will. But nevertheless, if you say to them, no, that's legal paperwork, confidential between me and my solicitor, they can't touch it. That's the law. Unless I suppose they're going to accuse you of some sort of crime and they... No, they can't touch it. It's legal paperwork. They can't touch it. Oh. Look it up in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984. Have you got... Have you put all of your knowledge into a... memoir or database or anything like that, Albert? Well, I've, I've got all of my letters and stuff which pretty well express a lot of the knowledge are on my, on my computer, good. yes. Good, good, good. That's good. Because, you know, all, all of this stuff is being all conveniently forgotten for obvious purposes. And, um, of course, once, if, whatever, um, if this, I don't know, corporate EU state comes about and... You know, and have, do you, have you read up on the, the TTIP treaty? The what? The TTIP. Oh, you mean the Transatlantic Treaty? Yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I don't have any thoughts on it. It's a Transatlantic Treaty to do with trade. It's a European treaty. Um, I don't think we should be involved in it. I think we should run our own treaties for trade. Um, and I think we should not be in the EU, so... How long have we got? How long have we got, Albert, before the hammer comes down? Will they try and bring the hammer down? I've no idea. I think they're speeding it up. I think they're speeding it up. Did you know something about this 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 November the 1st that's just gone and about the um, that all the treaties have already been ratified and they actually came into force on November the 1st? I think... Yeah. Do you, do you, do you, yeah, you see, the way, I, the way I look at it, I don't give a monkey's own what's been ratified or anything else. The whole lot are illegal under English constitutional law, therefore they don't count. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's see, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't do European treaties, I don't do metric measurements. No. Oh. I, I go to the doctors and they want to weigh me, they weigh me and they, and they tell me what it is. It's set in... in, in Kilograms, and I say, right now, that's no good to me. What's that in real money? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't do. Uh, so you, you, see, you were one of the. Um, you were one of the. Was you against decimalisation? Well, how oh, is cool. Is he gone? We lost him. <laughs> Yeah, we lost him. They've got some questions at him tonight. <laughs> He's doing well, we're nearly on three hours. Oh, I'm back. I'm back. I'll come back. I put my glasses down on the computer and turn the Skype off. <laughs> um, 
decimalisation. Decimalisation has been fully legal form of measurement in this country since 1860. Oh, not 1971 then? No, it's all been fully legal since 1860. The population of voted with their feet and decided not to use decimalisation and stick with imperial. Right. Right? So, it's been fully legal to do that, but the population have said, no, we don't want it, we're going to stick with imperial. Mm -hmm. Because they've stuck with imperial, uh, and, and it, it took the European Union and, and a load of traitors to actually force decimalisation onto us, um, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't count, you know. I mean, the people have bought, voted with their feet. Uh, if somebody asked me about decimalisation, I say, I haven't got the faintest fucking idea. Go away. <laughs> you know, just as somebody says to me, um, you know, we, we, we're going to replace a speedometer on your car with one that's in kilometres. I say, let's sod off. You're not getting near my car. <laughs> you know, not that's interested. Nice I must admit that the British public have stuck their heels in and they won't be bashed. You know, and if, if they if they paint all the road signs in kilometres, then I think we should go around, paint them over with a coat of white paint, and then write the right speed in in black. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, one more question, uh, if you don't mind, Albert. Go on. Uh, how about um, the obvious one, which is... Um, uh, your own... Um, I mean, because police often get you sort of that uh, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, get what? Hang on a minute, I'll get the word for it out of the minute. I've lost the bloody word for it. Um, basically, um, your privacy. Your privacy, because this is something that you apparently, you, you've got no right to privacy anymore. You know? Um, well, that's not true, is it? Well, yeah, because I, I, I actually I actually was asked by a police officer this some time ago, and he said, can, you know, um, he, didn't, he didn't say why. He asked me for my name and what, what I was doing. And I said, well, do it, uh, you know, let me know what's going on. I don't really want to give you my name, because um, unless, you know, you tell this guy, there's been a or something going on, that sort of thing. And he said, well, he said, I don't have to tell you that. I said, yes, you do. Because, you know, otherwise... Things can get out of hand, huh? So anyway, the top and bottom of it is, is he said, um, I was, he said, um, in other words, he said, well, you know, you, why won't you give me your name? You might, you know, I said, because I don't have to, unless you, unless you've got tangible evidence I've committed a crime or whatever. Um, he's quite nice about it. It's quite nice about it. I won't get upset or anything. And um, he said, well. What happens if I suspect you of something, right, and you're hiding something, you know, or, or anything like that? I mean, you know, well, what would you put in my blue name if, you know, have you got something to hide? And I just said, well, if, if you knew I had something to hide, you wouldn't be asking me that, would you? Well. And, and then, he, then, he, then, he, then he just went on, and I said, actually, I have. I said, it's called my privacy. With that, he just said, it's just a bit deep check there, and I said, well, you see, I'm not a young lad, I've, you know, whatever, if there's not been a crime committed, well, what, you know, if you want to tell me about if there's a crime committed, then yeah, sure, of course, you know, why not? <laughs> if you've got a, <laughs> a description of somebody matching my description, I'd, I'd work, yeah, I'd go and clear it up, because, you know, I'm going to go and catch the real bloody criminal if there's a crime. But there seems an inerrant thing about, you, well, you've got no right to privacy now. Well, no, you've got lots of rights. Yeah. The trouble, trouble is, a lot of policemen don't know what the law is, and a lot of policemen will try it on. He was quite nice about it in the end. And do you know what? He wasn't even a policeman. He was a community man. Albert, these, um, these letters, what you're talking about, you know, getting people to fill in, you said you've got templates for, yeah? Yeah. Which one would you prioritise as being the first one to hand out? Well, I think we need to get somebody arrested for treason. Well, so I, I think we I'll go for two Muslim treason. members of parliament. Say again? No. I think we go for the two Muslim members of parliament.
write to the Commissioner of Police demanding that he arrest the two Muslim members of Parliament with review to interviewing them under caution with a view to prosecuting them under the 1848 Treason Felony Act Section B. Right. But will they do that? Well, if enough people do it, they probably have to. Now, the, the beauty of this is, of course, but we not, have a problem. We have calling it probes and inquiries. Hang on, and hang on, we have a problem with Islam in this country, don't we? Yeah. We need to start a major, major fracas in this country with Islam in order to force the government to come down and crack down hard on Islam. Right? Well, not really. If, we, we just, we just no, don't, no, no, we just we don't, don't want to because No, because the government sit there and they're saying, oh no, Islam is a peaceful religion. It isn't. It's a murdering fucking cult, right? So what we do is, is we, we actually get the police to investigate and arrest and charge these two Muslim members of Parliament with Section 3 of the 1848 Treason Felony Act by committing treason by attempting to overawe the House of Lords so that they will give up their right, untrammeled right to free speech, right? Now, because it's Muslim members of Parliament and are going to get arrested, you're going to get massive support demonstrations of Muslims all over the shop. They're going to go around, they're going to, they're going to riot, they're going to do this, that and the other. They are going to, going to be murders on the bloody streets. And that is going to force the government to come down really hard. They're going to end up shooting Muslims, calling out the army to shoot the Muslims. I'm sure the army wouldn't mind that. And then... Once we've got that, the me personally, I think that's what, they, that's what they want. That's what they're waiting for. That's what they're hoping for. They'd allow well, any, they, at this point, they'd allow anything to happen. And he'd well, wait, and he'd no, but to, then you see, by the same advantage. token, by the same token, the actual indigenous people to these islands will see that the police were only actually doing the job the law required them to do and arresting two Muslims who are not British by birth, who are denizens who've managed to infiltrate them into a place they can't be legally um, and charge them with treason, which is what they have done because they're trying to use the threat of, of the race card to overawe the House of Lords to giving up their untrammeled right of free speech. Right? Now, that would then get all the Muslims out on the street. Oh, bloody, what's his name? Uh, who's that bearded twat? That bearded twat. Um, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he wants to go to Syria. I think we should well, put him in an era. Well, can I can I stop you there? Did, did yeah. you see the signing in of one of the Muslim MPs called Khan? And when he went to take his oath in Parliament, he replaced the Bible with the Quran. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. Now is that what's is that what's that? What? Well, it's his religious book, and you know, so they're going to do that. But I mean, you see, what you should say is, you you, you cannot. You see, Khan is not allowed. He he is a denizen. He is <laughs> not allowed to sit in Parliament. He can't, he can't even sit on your local town council. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you in midstream. Carry on. Sorry. Yeah, he can't even sit on your local town council. Every foreign, every every naturalised British subject who joins the police force would have to be sacked because they can't be police officers because that is a public office and they are banned by law from ever holding a public office in this country. Right. And this is the point. So, so what we need to do is, is get a, a very good excuse, engineer a very good reason, and, and arresting people for treason, for attempting to overawe the House of Lords is a good one, because it's 110% legal to arrest them. <clears throat> you, mentioned, was, you mentioned something, Albert, about uh, being on the father's side, if, you know, it, does, that yeah. not, does that not apply to these two? <coughs> well, talking? yeah, because, you know, the, her, her name's Qureshi, well, that's, that's not an English name, is it? And his name is Mahmoud, and that's not a bloody English name, so they're taking the, the, she's taking the, her husband's name, which you do, and he, he has taken a thing, you see, if, if you're an English woman, and you marry, say you marry an Arab, yeah? 
and you and you become Mrs. Mohammed, yeah? Okay. <clears throat> when your country does something and, and you're falling out with your husband's country, if you decide no, you've really got to come back and help your country, you then come back here. You then have to be apply to get your British nationality put back in the right place, which is prominent. Yeah? Right. You have to apply to get it back. Otherwise, they assume that you've taken the nationality of your husband. If you're, if, if you're talking about your father, you take the nationality of your father. If you're an English woman, you marry an Arab or a Frenchman and you have children, your, your, your children, if you're married to a Frenchman, are French. They are aliens. If you're an English man and you go to France and you marry a French woman and you have children, your children are English. This goes all goes back to the Naturalization Act of Edward III. Well, I'm all for it, Albert. Send me this template. <laughs> anyway, listen, chaps, I'm going to say good night. Yeah, no problem. Well, thanks for your time, Albert. It's always interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, it's, yeah, I enjoy it as well, so... It's educational on our part. I mean, although I'm, I'm getting a bit myself, um, I do remember certain bits and pieces, because when I went to school, there was little bits left still but very very little very little well, when, when i was at, when i was at school when we were 12 all of the 12 year olds were marched into the assembly hall yeah. and we all had to stand there and take the oath of allegiance yeah. because it is the law in this country that everybody on reaching the age of 12 has to take an oath of allegiance to the crown yeah. that's still the law but it's not done is it no, it's not. But then, you know, the schools now are fast becoming academies which are corporate owned. It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, I would still say, and in fact, I would, I would reverse that, and, and the NHS, I would reverse that. Yeah, you know, I, just, I just had my operation on my knee. Yeah. I, had it in, I had it in a private hospital. I yeah. had a magic carpet ride through. It was lovely in there, you know? Yeah. I have my own room. I've got a huge television on the wall, which I have to say I didn't watch. Um, and, and, you know, it was lovely. I get regularly waited on. People coming in throughout the day saying, oh, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like something to eat? You know. Um, and I think that the NHS should be like that. Do you, what about, um, about nationalisation of the utilities? Well, I think that should all be taken back Everything. under public control. Yeah, banks, lot. Bring it all back. Yeah, I think, I think we take, we, we take the, the, the Bank of England should be nationalised. Yeah. And we and we we actually print the money ourselves. We don't use the bankers to get it. We don't get them to print it, and then then we they charge us interest for the money they lend us. Mm -hmm. We print it ourselves. It costs us the cost of the paper and the ink, and that's it. Yeah. Um, and I think that, and I think we need to go back to the gold standard. Um, uh, me too. Something intrinsic. For crying yeah. Out. You know something. We do. Value, right? and, I, and I think that once once we're out of Europe. Uh, we take all that money that we're not paying to Europe. We take, we stop all foreign aid, at least for a period of 20 years, and we spend all that European money and all the foreign aid money on rebuilding the infrastructure in this country um, and and re-equipping our armed forces. And what we do is we say to the farmers, farm, feed the feed the nation. We don't care if your carrots look like corkscrews. Feed the nation. Do you know what I mean? Is it, is uh, it, is it, is it 53 million we, pound a day? We take, we take back our fishing grounds and, and one of the first thing we do is we go out and we hire or buy 200 fast inshore patrol boats to, to protect our fishing waters. Yeah. Any, any, any Spanish trawlers or French trawlers coming into our waters stealing our boat, uh, our fish, they are arrested, they're taken into a harbour, they're tried in a, in a, in, in a um, an Admiralty Court, prize court, uh, if, if they decide that they're going to impound the boat and take it, uh, it's taken and then it is sold to some of our farmers at a knockdown rate, uh, our fishermen at a knockdown rate, so we can get more people back out there fishing quicker. Yeah. 
that's that's one of the sad things that what what he's done, uh, and one of the one of the real kicking the bollocks as far as I'm concerned was to sell over the fishing industry. Well, Heath was a potato, wasn't he? Pure and simple. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, good night, chaps. Thanks for the chat. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Albert.